Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the IPI's Policy Forum on the Approach to the Protection of Civilians by the UN, EU, and NATO. My name is Agathe Sarfati. I'm a Senior Policy Analyst at IPI, and it is a pleasure to host today's discussion. Earlier this year, IPI published a policy paper on the very issue we are about to delve into, the different approaches to POC by the UN, the EU, and NATO. And we are privileged to have one of the co-authors with us today on the panel, Joachim Koops, as well as a great lineup of speakers who will speak to each of the organization's approach to POC. And we will also hear the perspective of the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC. Since the end of World War II, we've witnessed the rise of a so-called international human protection regime which led to the development of norms and laws related to the protection of civilians in armed conflict and beyond. And since the early 2000s, international and regional organizations have contributed to this trend, starting with the UN and then followed by other regional organizations, including the EU and NATO. Today, in a context where protection efforts are under intense political and operational pressures, in dozens of armed conflict situations around the world, how can the UN, the EU, and NATO work together to revitalize POC? This is the question we will deal with today. I also want to acknowledge that these three organizations are certainly not the only one involved in POC, and the African Union, for instance, is also a critical actor in this regard. But these three organizations are the focus of our conversation today. Before I kickstart our panel, I would like to thank the Kingdom of the Netherlands for its generous support to IPI's POC project over the years. I am now going to give the floor to Ambassador Zelen Rat, the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Netherlands to the UN for opening remarks. Ambassador, you have. Thank you so much, Agathe. And I like how you started uh, by discussing, let's say the broader framework of what we're uh, having on the menu today. And it made me think actually of something that the Secretary General of the United Nations said about, let's say, the state of, of the world and, and the United Nations in it. And he basically described the three phases of the United Nations and in that sense also world politics. And he said the first phase of the UN was basically in the bipolar world, in, in the Cold War, when there was a pretty clear distinction between the two political blocs and the non-aligned movement. And then that transitioned into the second phase, which was uh, the time of a unipolar world order. And then we are now currently in what is the third phase, according to the Secretary General, and he calls that the chaos phase. And I think it's actually a pretty accurate description of where we find ourselves in, especially today, as global power uh, blocks are shifting. And I think we're all feeling a little bit like we're people with forks in a world that is filled of, uh, with soup. And um, th the one thing I think we see when you also got to talked about how the normative framework has evolved over the years in international law and norms, uh, we've seen in those two phases how it was, let's say, uh, a, a, a furthering of these norms and treaties and that we're seeing now in this current phase, an erosion or a reshifting of these norms. And the ones that suffer most are civilians. And we only have to look, of course, at what is happening currently in Ukraine to see a resurgence of, of violence and destruction uh, at a scale that uh, hasn't been seen in a long while. And I think that makes this discussion today also so incredibly timely. Uh, and perhaps also um, when we look at this geopolitical situation, uh, the UN is often not seen as, let's say, the most flexible and agile actor. Uh, but when it comes to protection of civilians, I think it has in fact been a trailblazer and in the paper also read a standards bearer. And I think that makes it especially important also to today learn from what the UN has set as standards when it comes to protection of civilians, again, because it's become so acute currently. And to be able to share the knowledge within the UN, but certainly also of the EU and NATO, and to advance further this common aim uh, 
of protection of civilians in these very difficult geopolitical times is extremely important. And I would really applaud the authors, but also the IPI for the report. It's, it's extremely useful. I've read it with great interest. Uh, and also uh, with that view of what we're seeing today uh, in the current actuality, making sure that the protection of civilians is at the forefront of our efforts and that all the organizations that are involved in it, and maybe next time let's also involve an organization like the African Union, uh, that uh, these standards and um, these principles of protection of civilians are front, left and center in our efforts. So I, I wish all of you a very fruitful seminar today. I very much look forward to learning also from the panelists and I hand it back over to you, Agata. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your remarks and to the Netherlands for always championing POC. I will now turn to our panel. We will hear from five speakers. And during the panel, you can already start sharing questions in the Q&A, in the chat box, because there'll be time at the end of the event uh, to exchange uh, with the panelists and to ask questions. So we'll start uh, our panel with the co-author of the report, Professor Joachim Koops, who will share some of the main findings and recommendations of the paper, in particular as these relate to the comparative advantage that each organization brings into POC and the need for more coordination on POC. Joe Koops is a professor of security studies and the scientific director at the Institute of the Institute of Security and Global Affairs at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Thank you for being with us, Joe. You have the floor. Thanks, Agatha, and thanks to IPI, of course, for the great cooperation on this project and also to today's event and, and to the ambassador and, of course, the uh, Kingdom of the Netherlands for supporting POC uh, in a variety of, of ways. And <clears throat> very much should also mention that, uh, yeah, my co-author, Christian Patz, uh, who will also be in the audience, I think, um, uh, thanks to him, uh, and for this fruitful cooperation. Um, and much of this paper is also based on great exchanges and, and cooperation I had with, with other experts also on the panel today. For example, most importantly, Marla Keenan, um, who we've been, uh, which have been working with um, on, on the NATO side. Now, a um, couple of, of points then in these seven minutes where I want to summarize or point your attention towards key points of, of the paper. Um, as a quick background, it was mentioned already, the African Union was mentioned, maybe a quick explainer why we're focusing on NATO, EU um, and the UN. And of course, we know that other organizations, most importantly, the African Union are also an important actor on POC. But we also wanted to look from a membership perspective or allies perspective. There um, is a huge overlap, of course, in membership between NATO, EU and the UN. Uh, and a lot of aspects that are related to implementation of POC will, of course, depend on member states. Um, and for member states or allies, organizations are important for uh, toolboxes, dare I even to uh, say, uh, and different means of, of trying to drive POC policies and its implementation. So that, that's one of the reasons why it was important for us to focus on those three organizations, because also there is um, still a little bit of, I think, a need to understand the approaches of each organization a bit better. And also one of our recommendations is that indeed some of the uh, maybe prejudices about different organizations approaches uh, need to be tackled head on and, and knowledge I think about three organizations approaches is hereby important. But the overarching aim really is the advancement of the POC gender overall. And I don't have to tell anyone on, on this panel that POC in itself, despite massive advances during the last two decades is now under an extreme strain, uh, not only geopolitically, but also yeah, on a variety of, let's say political priority. Um, it is rhetorically speaking, always an important priority, but on the implementation and financing side and maybe um, attention span side, it, it's, it's a challenge to keep um, a variety of, of organizations and member states um, on, on the ball here. So um, the main point also was to look at um, what are the different organizations bringing to the table, how do they differ, what could be the limitation in terms of coordination and cooperation, we are wary of air, aware of the fact, of course, that um, there are some political limitations for closer cooperation between, for example, the UN and NATO, and there's also, let's say, a, a mindset a difference, uh, because, of course, 
as we outline in, in an overview, um, the mandates and the approaches to POC are different from the three organizations, and particularly NATO and the UN, even though they are more and more converging. Um, it is still true that NATO has developed a POC approach um, as a means to an end. So it's a means towards a, a larger operational end, and that is harm mitigation, trying to um, essentially reduce civilian casualties from its own operations. That one of, was one of the main points. But it also recently, really, since the 2016 policy, has focused far more on protecting civilians from the attacks of third parties. So this is much closer to the UN definition and UN approach. So even the difference that might have been um, quite strongly um, in the last years uh, seen between those two organizations is, is I think, um, more and more year by year reduced. Um, still, of course, there is uh there are uh let's say organizational cultural differences and also different views on on let's say human rights based approaches and so on and so forth the eu is somewhere in between um it we also wanted to show that it was a quite early adopter of puc already in 2003 it had its own puc policy um surprisingly and that was a very much a human rights based approach to puc and only in 2010 2015 where two uh, documents uh, and policies were adopted from the EU side, did it look more like the UN approach? There was a lot of ex cons consultations between EU officials and UN officials on PUC, and that's also reflected in the policies. The three tiers of the UN uh, UN's approach to PUC, for example, also feature in the EU's approach. And a lot in 2015, um, you know, seven years ago, we're talking about now, uh, was linked to the common security and defense policy. Um, there were also on the operational side of the EU's uh, common security and defense policy, some examples where explicit mandates um, included POC elements, uh, 2003 in the Congo, but also 2009 in Chad in the military mission. Um, the mandate itself had protection of civilians as, as part of it, um, Central African Republic as well in 2014. Now we know, of course, the EU changed its emphasis a little bit within the comp uh, common security and defense policy, more on training, more on military training missions in Mali, also now the uh, most recent one in um, Mozambique. There are also then in the mandate POC tasks, but those tasks are less about the implementation of practical uh, aspects of protecting civilians. So how do you do that as a soldier? Uh, but or, or, or interface with civil and military cooperation, but rather on international humanitarian law, basic training. Now that's of course important, um, but it is a little, um, yeah, not not the full scale that you could expect. The EU could play um, a role when it tries to um, put POC center stage of its training missions. Now uh, we will probably have some time later on to talk about how Ukraine might uh, change all of that. Uh, it's clear that a lot of aspects um, that were maybe uh, seen as no longer possible a couple of years ago for the EU are now changing. Uh, lots of uh, realizations on the EU side that the common security and defense policy has to be uh, strengthened again. Uh, and it's now an important window of opportunity here, I think, also to, to re-ignite um, the POC agenda, hopefully within the EU, uh, which also means, of course, reinforcing the institutional uh, resources and 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 approaches and maybe also an update of a POC policy of the EU that um, you know is now seven years old. NATO has um, I'm deliberately fo focusing a bit more on NATO and the EU because I think in this audience on IPI many people are familiar with the UN's approach. But happy also talk more about uh, that in the Q and A. Uh, for NATO, NATO is kind of at the crossroads now um, since the policy was adopted, the POC policy in 2016. A lot has happened. Uh, you know, military um, plans on implementing POC, a variety of, of uh, action plans. And now it is within the concept of human security that on the political level, POC is still being talked about. But of course, Russia's uh, uh, invasion of Ukraine has changed a lot in terms of the thinking for NATO, because now the question of protection of civilians and urban warfare is no longer just a question about somewhere outside um, far away um, of the Allies' uh, territory uh, that POC might have to be implemented, but now it really much is close to home in terms of how can Article 5 operations really um, effectively implement the protection of civilians whilst being essentially faced with urban warfare. 
Um, and that requires not only military tools, but also effective cooperation with civilian actors, with humanitarian actors, uh, but also a really strong POC preparedness. Um, and of course, the comparative advantage that NATO obviously has on the military side is somewhat compensated or counteracted by um, still a relatively uh, or less pronounced um, effective cooperation with civilian sides uh, active in POC if we compare that to the UN. That's of course where the UN has its strength. Uh, the ambassador mentioned uh, that it's a still a kind of standard, standard bearer. That's absolutely correct. It has institutionalized POC like no other organization uh, um, from training uh, from, from uh, training manuals and revisions of trainings to really um, very clear guidance, um, handbooks, and of course, operational experiences. Um, in another study that Christian and I did for the German Ministry of Defense, we broke down the 2019 POC policy to strategic, operational, and tactical tasks that a member state would have to uh, be able to carry out if they wanted to implement the POC policy. And we came uh, to a number of around 740 tasks, 740 different tasks that essentially uh, a member state uh, would have to um, be able to perform if you want to comprehensively implement POC. It shows also the, the, the breadth, I think, and innovation on the POC side that the UN has um, advanced. Now, where to go um, from here? All three organizations face th their same challenges uh, in terms of the changing operational environment. We've talked about that. Also, finance finances and also political leadership uh, within each organization requires that POC is taken seriously and that the value of it is seen not just as an add-on, but as a core task. Um, we see coordination, um, despite, again, organizational differences as key. Exchanges of lessons learned happen in informal fora, but there is a lot to be said about also joint trainings that uh, are, are slowly emerging, um, but also joint planning um, for a, a variety of scenarios. We, in the paper, make um, a variety of recommendations under um, four headings. First of all, the organizations need to um, adapt POC to the new operational realities in a post-Afghanistan and now in a Ukraine-Russia environment that requires a, a rethinking and adaptation, um, which also means including urban warfare issues, but also uh, POC in the cyber realm. Um, the second set of recommendations is uh, about the importance of revitalizing discussions on POC within and between the organizations. And here you need really national champions that advance the POC agenda cross-organizationally. So ideally, member states that are in, active in all three organizations that really should drive the POC agenda forward and the coordination, or at least what you can learn from each um, organization to advance it. Increase awareness and knowledge of the differences, similarities, and potential synergies between all three organizations on POC and ideally advance further pragmatically into organizational coordination, even if member states are not interested in pursuing formal inter-organizational cooperation on POC. Training, preparedness, and institutionalization needs to be improved, and there are a variety of opportunities, reinforcing, for example, the training networks between the three organizations, uh, and here, including the African Union, is an important player here indeed as well for the three organizations. Um, promote PUC preparedness, which uh, includes ideally at the national level, audits and capability assessments, um, and also cross lessons from each member states in their participation in different uh, missions from each organization, fostering a PUC mindset, investing in staffing and institutionalization of PUC units. We see a kind of decrease of the staffing in PUC units. It's of particular concern in the EU, but also NATO. Um, and finally, uh, it's important to also include and learn from each other when it's uh, coming to the uh, question of human rights due diligence policies. The EU is busy with it now. It can learn a lot from the UN on that side. Um, and also, of course, focus on prevention of human rights abuses um, and civilian casualties caused by uh, your own troops, as well as, of course, developing a more active POC approach um, on, on the side of NATO, where a lot can be learned um, at the UN side. I think I'm uh, running out of time, so I'll leave it here, but of course, happy to answer any further questions on the paper or 
or any other aspects related to this topic. Thank you very much, Joe. And I really encourage uh, all of you to, to download and, and read the, the paper and really the comprehensive uh, analysis of the, of the three approaches to, to POC. And, and you know, thank you for also uh, discussing a bit the, the recommendations because with those in mind, we'll now turn to our second speaker from the ICRC. And we're really glad to welcome Eva Voboda, the Deputy Director of International Law and Policy of the ICRC. Eva will share with us insight from the ICRC on its decades long experience in situations of armed conflict around the world, where the ICRC promotes the international humanitarian law and carries out humanitarian activities, including in numerous contexts where the UN, the EU and NATO have been present. We are particularly interested in hearing from you, Eva, about the perspective of the ICRC because the ICRC is really the guardian of IHL and the protection of civilian norms can be traced back to IHL. So thank you very much for being with us, Eva. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Agathe, and, and thank you to IPI for the invitation to provide some insights on the protection of civilians, which, as you said, is, is really at the heart of what the ICRC does. Our mandate to guard and promote IHL comes from the Geneva Conventions. More importantly here, I would say it's not what is written in the conventions, but what is uh, complied with, so how it is implemented, and, and uh, Joachim already um, alluded to that. Um, it's the implementation of these norms that is really critical, because that is what reduces civilian suffering and conflict. We see it in a number of different um, in different areas, and I, I would say probably in more than 50 situations of active armed conflict, we see violations of international humanitarian law. What that means is that these violations of IHL, they lead to deaths and disappearances of civilians, to the separation of families, the destruction of essential infrastructure, such as hospitals, schools, and other essential services. IHL compliance is really a matter of life and death for those not taking part in hostilities. And of course, our role also is to engage with parties to a conflict in a bilateral and confidential dialogue to make them aware of these obligations and make sure that these are respected. I wanted to use uh, the example of um, fighting in coalitions as an illustration of how POC might be, might be enhanced. And I want to do that because when we look at today's conflicts, they really involve an ever increasing dense network of actors often fought in coalitions with partners, proxies and, and allies. State and non-state armed groups provide each other with various types of support, including private military and, uh, and security companies or PMSCs, with activities ranging from political, financial, logisticals, arms transfer support to advising, training, equipping, kinetic support and other activities in, in between. While these support relationships in conflict have the potential to increase the risk of IHL violations due to what we call a diffused authority that, that can occur in such partnerships, we also see an opportunity to strengthen protection of civilians through um, the ability to influence the respect for IHL and thus reducing the human cost of war. If a supporting actor becomes aware of problematic behavior by its partners, it can choose to limit or halt its support until the problem is addressed. Alternatively, a supporting partner can choose to increase its engagement in a way that will help the supported partner improve the protection of civilians. I'd like to mention here a publication that we, we uh, put out last year um, called Allies, Partners and Proxies, Managing Support Relationships to Reduce the Human Cost of War. And I'm happy to provide a link for those who are interested, where we really looked at the various types of support relationships we see in conflicts, identify the protection of civilian risks in each, and provide practical measures to consider the, in the preparation, implementation, and transition phases of support relationships. All of which are designed to increase IHL compliance by partners. As multilateral actors, the UN, NATO and EU can ensure that POC is at the very center of the support they provide to partners. These organizations have extensive tools, and, and again, we heard for some of these tools and instrument, instruments that, have, that, have, um, that, that are being used and the capacities at their disposal, as well as professional militaries that can offer training, establish um, standard operating procedures and rules of engagement, draft processes that reduce civilian casualties or support institutional capacity building with protected populations in mind, such as uh, detainees, the missing or, or dead. <clears throat> 
The UN, the EU and NATO in supporting a party to a conflict can assess their partner's will and capacity to comply with IHL, establish mitigating measures to address gaps, monitor partner behavior in a systematic way, and take action when concerns are identified. Let me touch briefly on, on, on a couple of critical issues or critical points for each of the, these organizations. In the UN, peacekeeping missions themselves involve numerous types of support relationships between member states within the mission and between the peacekeeping missions and host states. As such, peacekeeping missions are in a privileged position to influence parties to the conflict. This means they can apply measures that increase compliance with IHL. For example, on detention, the UN can require a host state which it supports to incorporate measures to reduce the risk of ill treatment and torture during detention operations. Also, the UN Human Rights Due Diligence Policy, or HRDDP, offers a sound framework to influence the behaviors of those parties whom the UN supports. We have seen this to be especially effective in the case of MONUSCO, and I seem to remember that in the report, in fact, this was also mentioned. However, in, in other UN peacekeeping operations, uh, HRDDP leverage may be less effective, and we think that is largely due to lack of staff with the specific training, and Joachim, you mentioned that as well, um, uh, dedicated time to carry out the monitoring of state partners' behavior um, and, other, and other points. So we would really encourage the UN to increase resources and focus on this important tool. Of course, this also um, requires political will to be implemented. The EU's Common Security and Defence Policy, CSDP, has military missions in a range of countries, and we heard some examples, Mali, the Central African Republic, Somalia, Mozambique. The EU has also committed to embed IHL and POC in, an, in its external action, providing various types of support, political, financial and military, to actors involved in armed conflict. And lastly, the EU has established the European Peace Facility, a new instrument to fund military capacity building of partners. And at this point, we would really um, recommend to the EU to use these three different instruments to leverage its partners for greater IHL compliance and protection of civilian outcomes. In line with the UN's human rights due diligence policy, the EU has also committed to develop its own HRDDP for its security sector reform. This would be an important tool to establish the IHL protection of civilian standards that the potential supported partners should meet or commit to meet in order to receive EU support. It would also signal the EU's intent to prioritize international humanitarian law, international human rights law and POC. Like the, e, uh, like the UN, the EU needs to ensure adequate resources and staff with the right skills and expertise, especially on IHL, in its crisis management structures and military missions in the field. And coming lastly to NATO, NATO allies demonstrate commitment to IHL in their national leg legislation. And again, we've heard that, uh, that example. So national legislations, military manuals, doctrines and training standards. NATO itself has developed a protection of civilian strategy and will launch a NATO strategic concept expected to be adopted during the 2022 NATO summit at the end of this month. This strategic concept is a collective reaffirmation that IHL and POC remain core elements of NATO's response to current and future security threats and security tasks, ranging from large-scale uh, large -scale combat to cyber warfare. The POC strategy Article 22 states that when training of local security forces is part of the Council agreed mandate, NATO should share best practices and experiences on POC, particularly civilian harm mitigation, in line with existing NATO policies. We would encourage NATO to ensure the full implementation of POC policy and military concepts through incorporating them into doctrine, education, training, exercises, lessons learned, and operational processes and procedures. We also encourage NATO to lead by example, using its influence to pass on human security and POC standards to its part many partners, including host nation forces and crisis zones. Additionally, past valuable efforts made in this regard by NATO and Afghanistan can educate future missions where support is provided to a local partner. And lastly, I would like to recommend our recently published Partner Military Operations Handbook, which is an annex to the previously mentioned uh, publication, Allies, Partners and Proxies. 
It can be used as a resource to NATO's ambition in training partners in defense capacity and providing mili expert military expertise to them. The PM PMO, a partner military operation handbook, is a very relevant tool for these NATO core activities. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Eva, for this very interesting presentation and for providing concrete recommendations as to the way the UN, the EU and NATO can uh, promote uh, respect for IHL uh, when uh, they are part of support uh, relationships in different uh, contexts. And on this, I would really please uh, do share uh, the links with us uh, of the two publications uh, you mentioned. You, you're really welcome to do so. Um, in the chat box. Thank you. We're now moving to, <clears throat> to our three speakers who will discuss the three organizations uh, and their approach to POC. We are going to start with Dirk Druet, adjunct professor at McGill University and an IPI non-resident fellow. Dirk, you're going to tell us more about the POC's approach by the UN. The UN was the first organization among the three to develop a POC policy and has accumulated much POC experience in the last 20 years. So we very much look forward to hearing your assessment on this operationalization and the potential for more cooperation with your other organizations. Thank you very much, Dirk. You have the floor. Thanks so much, Agath, and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, and thank you so much to the to the Kingdom of the Netherlands for, for making this possible. Um, and thank you also to the authors. I, I really enjoyed um, reading the paper and and um, as someone who works, you know, primarily um, from a UN perspective, it was really uh, useful to me and, and, and informative to learn about how um, the UN's POC, POC approach has, has contributed to and learned from uh, these other two organizations. Um, I wanted to mention uh, one issue of framing in the paper that I thought was, was interesting and I and, uh, wanted to, to make a comment on and then um, to speak to a couple of the uh, sets of recommendations as they uh, apply to, to the UN. Um, on the framing issues, um, so obviously the paper is um, uh, focused on a POC, the protection of civilians as defined by UN peacekeeping operations. And, and uh, that you know, is, is defined essentially by the three tiers, you know, political, um, operational, and uh, capacity building and, and protective environment, um, which essentially, you know, contextualizes the use of force in a larger uh, strategy. And it's, uh, of course, understandable that uh, we would use, to focus, use that, uh, that focus because, of course, it, it uh, uh, maps quite closely to how NATO and EU operations um, uh, are designed. But when it comes to how uh, those two sets of operations interact with actors on the ground on issues related to protection, I think it only tells a uh, part of the story of how uh, the UN uh, does protection in, um, in situations of conflict. And I'm thinking, uh, for example, of special political missions, which of course do not have um, military or police components, um, but are uh, often mandated by the Security Council to act um, in, in uh, support of human rights and in even some cases to protect civilians also in situations of uh, armed conflict. And for example, uh, the United Nations assistance mission in uh, Afghanistan was in really no small part responsible for helping to spur uh, NATO's thinking on civilian casualties through its um, monitoring, reporting, and advocacy on civilian casualties um, caused by all parties to, to the conflict in Afghanistan. And, um, and then, of course, there are other um, types of protection roles played by um, different types of UN and human rights and, and humanitarian actors on the ground that uh, will inevitably interact with um, uh, NATO and, and EU missions, um, and do, of course. Um, this could include, for example, um, uh, protection from gender-based violence and conflict-related sexual violence, uh, work undertaken by the UN Population Fund, by UN Women, um, as well as activities uh, focused on the protection of refugees and, and migrants. And uh, I'd suggest that these protection roles and partners could really be of equal, if not greater importance on the ground to EU and NATO operations in informing uh, their harm mitigation strategies, 
and also in terms of helping them implement and monitor HRDDP measures. Uh, and, and I certainly welcome the recommendation to strengthen those, those uh, elements in, in the two organizations, um, especially for in relation to uh, national partners. So that was one thought just on, on the question of framing. Um, and now let me turn to, to some of the recommendations where I, I thought there was really quite a lot of um, useful and operationally valuable suggestions around the institutionalization and staffing up of um, protection capacities in, in all three organizations. And this certainly reflects the lessons learned in peacekeeping operations, which has um, uh, really found that consistent presence of POC advisors in mission settings is, is critical in keeping uh, protection at the center of missions thinking and planning and operations, but even more so in uh, contributing actively to operational planning and um, uh, targeting, for lack of a better word, um, uh, helping the military and police components of peacekeeping operations respond to POC uh, threats. So I think that that is a critical um, recommendation. Um, when it comes to the recommendations on interorganizational cooperation across uh, the three organizations, um, certainly I think it can be useful to share lessons and, and good practices, but I would call for a little bit more caution uh, when it comes to more operational cooperation in theater. Um, and, and the way we, we speak about that coordination at the political level. Um, and from the UN perspective, I think there is a significant interest in uh, you know, more closely considering some of the dilemmas and risks involved uh, with cooperating with parallel forces on protection issues. Um, in practice, you know, this generally uh, consists of you know, intelligence sharing and coordinated targeting. Um, and when it comes to, to the sharing of information, I think it is critical for the UN's protection uh, functions uh, to make sure that this collaboration doesn't undermine its legitimacy particularly in terms of its uh, unique ability to engage politically with all the parties to the conflict uh, to support mediation and peace negotiations, which is after all the, you know, the, the core role of UN peace operations when they're deployed into these situations and, and certainly represent uh, their uh, comparative advantage and, and added value. Um, and for this reason, I think it's important to ensure that, uh, that this information that's gathered you know, is shared with, when it, when it is shared with partners is not used for activities that might be outside the UN's mandate or that could result in human rights or IHL violations. You know, for example, through operations that might uh, take a higher tolerance for civilian casualties than that of the UN or activities such as you know, extra judicial killings outside of hostilities. Um, and uh, I think the, the best way to ensure the, the, the ring fencing of the information in that way is to clarify uh, internally for the for the UN, that um, the sharing of information uh, constitutes operational support as defined under the human rights due diligence policy, and that means that when UN missions are sharing um, information with uh, parallel forces, uh, such as EU or or NATO uh, operations, that they are doing so um, having done a risk assessment and uh, and uh, are monitoring the use of that information. Um, just one more um, uh, thought on the capacity building recommendations um, and the suggestion of, of building up uh, training networks um, and, and focusing on POC preparedness, skills, capabilities, mindsets. You know, certainly from the UN's perspective, there continues to be enormous need to build um, the capacities of troop and police contributors, um, as well as uh, civilian entities and missions, um, most of which are, of course, not EU and NATO member states. To, uh, to undertake um, POC roles. But for NATO and EU countries in, in particular, um, when they think about how uh, those member states um, uh, contribute to POC in a UN context, I, I would suggest a slightly uh, alternative focus uh, to that taken in the paper, which is to, to focus um, on helping EU and NATO member states um, undertake POC activities when they are deployed in peacekeeping operations as UN troop contributing countries or police contributing countries. And here, I think this has less actually to do with the, TO, uh, the POC toolboxes of NATO and, and the EU as such, but actually um, a question more of overall doctrinal flexibility of NATO um, and EU um, troop contributors that would allow them to work in peacekeeping environments um, 
uh, more flexibly and to work with UN structures and processes, uh, deeply imperfect uh, though they, they may be. And, and I say that because um, you know, the recent deployments of um, EU member states um, to peacekeeping missions, and particularly the, the UN mission in, in Mali, I think has highlighted on the one hand how uh, some of the capacities these, um, these member states bring are, are unique and can be extremely valuable to missions operational capacity, including in, in relation to POC tasks. But also, um, these countries really have struggled to work seamlessly and with a minimum of transaction costs with mission structures and processes and in cooperation with non-European uh, troop contributors when doctrine capacities and practices of those actors you know, differ from allied joint doctrine um, and the interoperability experiences that were gained and, and so deepened in, in Afghanistan. Um, so just to, to conclude, I think collectively, indeed, these three organizations have, have an interest in, in cooperating uh, selectively and pragmatically, but I, I would suggest that we stop short of aiming for sort of, um, uh, political or operational convergence across the organizations for their own sake. Uh, but certainly a lot of opportunities to, to continue sharing and, and adapting as all of our uh, protection approaches uh, evolve. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dirk, for your remarks and for engaging with the recommendations of the report and providing the, the UN perspective uh, in this regard. You pointed not only to the core principle of impartiality of UN peacekeeping and the need to be cautious uh, when more cooperation is spurred. So maybe this is a point we could go back on during the Q&A. Before uh, moving on to the next uh, panelist, I really just want to uh, uh, reiterate uh, Beatrice's call on the chat that uh, the, the audience is uh, welcome to pose their question to the panel in, in using the Q&A function. So uh, please do so um, so when we, so we are able to uh, engage with the panel during the Q&A uh, session. We'll now uh, move on to discuss the EU's approach to POC. And we are lucky to have with us Ambassador Silvio Gonzato the Deputy Permanent Representative and Deputy Head of Delegation of the European Union to the UN. Ambassador Gonzato, I was recently reading that 13 out of 17 EU missions are deployed in parallel to UN missions. So there's been much potential for the EU and the UN to cooperate on POC. And we very much look forward to hearing your take on the topic. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fatih, and thank you to IPI and, uh, and the Kingdom of the Netherlands for, for organizing this very uh, interesting uh, discussion. And to, the IPI, to IPI also for your policy paper, which provides a, a really interesting overview about uh, POC-related uh, developments within the three organizations um, on a topic which is central to our EU foreign policy, and in particular, our common security and defense policy. Um, as you elaborate in your study, uh, the EU has in the past deployed multiple short-term military operations with a specific POC mandate, uh, and primarily so in support of U UN missions. But since 2009, uh, we have shifted our focus to non-executive training missions, which focus more on capacity building, providing training to partner forces, but they don't have a mandate to carry out activities in those theaters, for example, in terms of providing physical protection from violations. And we, in the past decade, we've had four of these uh, types of military missions. We, you know them in Somalia, in Mali, in the Central African Republic, and most recently in Mozambique. Um, the training, of course, is focused on international humanitarian law and international human rights law. But I'll be, I'll be quite candid with you. Um, we have realized that uh, geopolitical developments, uh, as well as the increasingly uncertain political and security situation in, and environment in some of these countries, um, have shown that um, the, uh, these type of missions have limitations uh, and uh, they, um, they do not necessarily uh, you know, deliver on the objectives that have been set for them. And we've seen these limitations, particularly in Mali and the Central African uh, Republic. Uh, we've seen how this training uh, 
has failed to ensure compliance with international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Um, in parallel, we've also been, as you say, uh, you know, you know, working on uh, and, and providing leadership on uh, peacekeeping uh, operations under the Human Security and Defense Policy uh, under a UN mandate. Um, but one challenge that we face more and more these days is in uh, securing the renewal of the necessary United Nations Security Council uh, uh, mandate, which authorizes these EU operations. And um, an example has been recently the Operation Irini's mandate in Libya, off the coast of Libya, where clearly Russia was intent on undermining um, the uh, the mandate of our operation, tried to reduce it to six months. Then luckily, our French colleagues uh, ably uh, steered the negotiations and managed to confirm the 12-month 12 12 mandate, um, but with our sort of review clause after six, six months. Um, and another uh, operation which is looming uh, up uh, uh, and is lining up for renewal in November is Operation Altea in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We'll have to see how uh, the um, representative of the Russian Federation will play it out. So there are uncertainties there. Um, at the same time, the EU has been engaged in, a, in an overall reflection on our um, security and defense policy and adopted in March uh, this year uh, the um, EU strategic com compass, which is a strategic analysis of the geopolitical, geopolitical developments uh, uh, in the world, but is also a way of promoting innovative ways of engaging in different theaters and also promoting greater coordination in defense uh, spending. Um, and the, the, the discussion now is really about readapting our EU training missions, uh, EUTMs as we call them, to make them more efficient, more responsive, more flexible, as was uh, mentioned by some of the previous speakers. And the options we're looking at are, are multiple. The first one is to um, ensure that their mandates are more robust, they are scalable, and they are also more flexible to, to be more in line with the sort of the fluid situation on the ground. With the possibility of allowing also some executive tasks, such as, for example, accompaniment. So you don't just train, but then you mentor and accompany the implementation of the principles that you've been training local forces uh, about. Uh, the second one is more focused on prevention. And that, of course, means that the EU would be able to intervene before a conflict escalates. And this would be particularly you know, relevant, I would say, in situations like uh, in the Gulf of Guinea, for example, um, and, and make sure that the mandate is tailored to the needs and the context of the partner countries in which we are operating. And third is um, we're looking at ways of combining these training missions with uh, the provision of assistance through the European Peace Facility, which allows us, as you know, to provide equipment um, you know, also including military equipment uh, that matches the sort of the, the software with which we, we equip uh, local forces also with the hardware. Um, this, of course, uh, means that uh, we have to ascertain that the equipment is provided in compliance with the international humanitarian law and international human rights law. This was very much a uh, preoccupation of the European Parliament when it came to adopting this, this new instrument. You refer in your policy paper, but also Eva uh, Svoboda in her intervention to the need to develop a human rights uh, due diligence policy on security sector support. We have some elements of it, but not, there's not an integrated holistic uh, approach to, to this issue. And that's why we've included this tasking, which is also mentioned in the uh, strategic compass in our EU action plan for human rights and democracy, which encompasses the 2020 to 2024 uh, period. And the purpose of these frameworks will be to ensure that our security sector support that we provide to third party is in compliance with international humanitarian law and human rights law. This has been in the pipeline for quite a while, but I think now we really have the momentum to ensure that this is put in place. And we are cooperating with the UN, which has already a framework uh, uh, in place. Um, in order to uh, you know, learn from the experience of the UN, but also uh, see how we can uh, strengthen our cooperation in that respect. Um, 
Finally, uh, in terms of uh, EU-UN cooperation, uh, we have adopted recently a set of priorities for the EU-UN strategic partnership in peace operation and crisis management for 2022 to 2024. And there are there specific actions that we foresee on promoting compliance with international humanitarian human rights law. Um, but uh, I have to admit that there is only one specific reference on to POC in this context, and that refers to the G5 Sahel joint workforce. So there's definitely uh, scope for increased cooperation in, in that respect. I'll stop here, Agathe, and then uh, you know, look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Ambassador Donzato, for, for your remarks and for discussing the shift of the EU toward more training missions, whose role are to, to promote uh, compliance with IHL, but also to point to the fact that the EU might move toward more support uh, relationship and develop its own uh, HR uh, DDP. So here uh, you echoed many of the aspects mentioned uh, before indeed uh, by, by Eva Svoboda from the ICRC. Last but not least, we are going to hear from Marla Keenan about NATO. Marla is an adjunct senior fellow at the Stimson Center where she leads the project on strengthening NATO's ability to protect. Marla, many people have been skeptical over NATO's future role as a POC actor, in part because it is at the heart of a military alliance. Yet NATO has often provided security guarantees to other organizations in several contexts. You have widely researched the approach and operationalization of, NATO, of POC by NATO, so we are very happy to, to learn from you today. Over to you, Marla. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you to IPI for having this discussion today, because I think it's uh, really incredibly important. It's a very important time for NATO, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. Um, and thank you also to Ambassador Zaunrath and the um, Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs for funding this policy forum, but also for the work um, that my organization, the Stimson Center, does in um, collaboration with PAX. Um, they have been a big supporter and a great partner for us. So that's very much appreciated. And I think very soon, as I mentioned, um, later on this month after the NATO summit, uh, we're going to be able to see some really positive movement in human security uh, and POC spaces in NATO. And so that will be due in part um, to that support and to the work of many NGOs and organizations uh, working on this issue every day. So um, it's a bit of a heavy lift to go after so many distinguished speakers. So I'm going to try and keep your attention and keep it short here. Um, and I want to start with a little bit of an overview about NATO and then move into sort of human security and how NATO sees POC under that larger umbrella of human security. Um, I think you will see that its approach is both different, but also similar to what um, the UN and the EU um, have in terms of how they approach POC. So NATO is a values-based organization, as we know, and respect for life and the protection of civilians during conflict and crisis is an essential part of those values. So it's actually a natural um, ally for protection of civilians based on its founding documents and its founding values. Um, and it's this nexus that connects all three of NATO's core tasks, which are collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security together. So looking at the alliance's past, present, and future operations, protecting civilians has been, and I think will continue to be an integral part of mission success. Um, yet as the NATO, um, as the alliance is ending its sort of two decade engagement in Afghanistan, some of the people that we were working with were arguing that POC was no longer a value um, and that in a near peer, large scale existential fight, POC would actually be irrelevant or at least of less strategic relevance. But I think now based on what we're all seeing um, in Ukraine and specifically with the individual allies responses um, to that conflict and crisis, that the opposite is actually more likely to be based um, to, to be the, the, the situation. Um, you can see that sort of, you know, we're hearing a lot of discussion about protection of civilians when that was not always uh, the core sort of, uh, the core message that we were hearing. We see President Zelensky talking about the importance of the citizens of his country. And we see the allies talking about the importance of protecting the citizens of Ukraine. 
Um, so in the future, I think POC is, is considered the kind of common denominator of human security. And that also encompasses protection of civilians, including those at particular risks, such as women and children. Um, so at present, there's no agreed upon NATO definition of human security, but we hope to report um, that that is changing soon, especially um, coming up on the end of uh, the summit here in uh, late June. So functionally for NATO, the term human security relates to risks and threats to populations where NATO has operations, missions, activities, and how to mitigate and respond to these threats. So human security currently functions as a home for several other cross-country, uh, cross-cutting topics that focus on protecting civilians um, of different types. So you have combating human trafficking and uh, human trafficking, you have protection of civilians in armed conflict, you have preventing and responding to conflict related sexual violence, you have cultural property protection, and then of course you have the protection of civilians. So this gets us very quickly to the heart of the, the discussion today, which is protection of civilians. As, uh, as Joe mentioned um, at the Warsaw Summit in 2016, NATO leaders adopted the NATO policy on the protection of civilians. And the aim was to set out a coherent, consistent, and integrated approach to protecting civilians in NATO-led operations in their missions and all of their activities. In 2017, they came up with an action plan that was meant to help uh, implement um, the, the policy. In 2018, there was a military concept that was developed. And in 2021, there was um, a military handbook that was developed to help kind of dive a little bit deeper into what this actually looked like in practice. So NATO of course recognizes the importance of reducing the impact of its actions on the civilian populations in conflict zones, uh, which is what we commonly refer to as civilian harm mitigation. But importantly under the policy, and I think this is what was really um, sort of forward looking they also talked about the strategic importance of protecting uh, citizens and civilians from um, our adversaries, including those who might seek to harm them as a strategy of their operations. And so NATO's concept on POC lays out this sort of broad framework um, to synchronize an understanding across the organization and the allies which is the foundation um, which they build capacity um, to protect civilians. So the concept has three central elements. The first is mitigating harm. This is the part where it talks about not only protect from your own operations, but also protect from what others might be doing um, in order to harm the population. There's facilitating access to basic needs. This is a very much um, support function where they should be working together with humanitarian actor, act, uh, actors to facilitate the ability for them to get life-saving um, materials to civilians who are caught in conflict and crisis. And then you have contribute to a safe and secure environment, which is sort of that longer term look at rule of law, supporting those structures. Um, and then a fourth element, and to me, the one that is most critical because I think it actually allows uh, the ability to um, do all of the rest of the, the, the tasks that are required, and that's understanding the human environment. That's a little bit different than what um, I think NATO has done in the past. There's been, you know, I, I think we can talk about the allies and how successful they've been in intelligence, looking at the, the adversary and how the adversary might attack them and how they might counter that attack, but they haven't focused so much on how the adversary might attack civilians. And that to me is what this understanding the human environment allows them to do is to really understand how that civilian population in a large scale combat operation in an urban uh, operation, how that might actually um, allow them to better protect the population. So um, you can probably see that these actually don't track too far, um, especially from what the UN does. Um, so you could draw direct parallels, in my opinion, from the, the UN's establishment of a protective environment to the um, creating a safe and secure environment on NATO's side. And then another example would be the provision of physical protection to mitigating harm on the NATO side. Um, and really in some, in, some, uh, in some states to facilitating access to basic needs. That to me is really about keeping the population safe 
um, well and, and um, having access to the things that they need to survive in their daily lives. So in my opinion, there are of course a few notable gaps and capabilities to protect civilians in future conflicts, um, NATO specific, and they include things like the development of a protection assessment and planning capability. So we know that part of the action plan for NATO was to integrate, um, not to create separate document uh, doctrine, but to integrate these capabilities into existing doctrine, um, including uh, planning directives. And I think there's still a little bit of work to be done there. Um, of course, inst institutionalization of best practices and civilian harm mitigation, which is the protection from one's own operations. We see that NATO has actually adopted um, and, and sort of integrated this into their thinking and planning, but sometimes it's the only thing um, that, that we see that they're doing. There's not really that recognition of the other side. So institutionalizing those, those, um, those best practices is very helpful because you know, as people rotate out, as years go on, we want to make sure those are codified in policy and practice and not just, uh, you know, personality and experience driven. So the third is adoption of clear guidance and scenario based training on how to protect civilians from other actors, including at the strategic operational and tactical um, levels um, and how they actually work when they're taking part in an allied operation versus when they're in a partnered operation with other security forces. Um, systematizing an approach to integrating civilian experts and expertise in the NATO planning and implementation of protection of civilians is really important because, as you know, NATO is very different from the UN. It does not deploy with a large civilian contingent that's watching sort of what is going on on that side. It deploys as a defensive military force, right? So um, just a different, a different reason for existence, but also, you know, an understanding that there does need to be some level of, of civilian interaction in there to help the military planners um, as they go and they plan their operations. Um, I think some of the main challenges that I still see, um, I've worked across the AU and the UN um, and to some extent the EU, but NATO is now my specific focus. So while the policy was adopted in 2016 um, and it has the action plan and all of these really important documents that go along with it, including the concept and the handbook, um, it's still not as well socialized across um, NATO, um, particularly on the military side as I'd like it to be. Um, and this is the point where I'm also going to note that POC is not just a military um, uh, approach, it's so important for the political side to also be, have a strong sort of POC muscle memory because they're the ones that will be mandating these operations and they need to understand what, you know, what their policy says, but also how to mandate it in a way that the military can see what those end goals are that they're looking for. Um, and then obviously as NATO shifts focus away of out of area operations, like we saw in Afghanistan and Libya, and more to, to to collective defense. There's been a few bumps in the road, as I mentioned. You know, some of the folks that we were talking to were really convinced that it wasn't actually something um, that needed to be considered when it was a you know large scale combat operation with existential um, battles. I would argue that it's actually more important, especially for an alliance like NATO, where civilian security is one of the stated goals. Um, that keeping your own population safe, if we're talking about an Article 5 operation, is actually absolutely mission critical. Um, and then finally, as different allies um, have different definitions, concepts, and approaches to POC, this has caused some confusion or at least um, some sort of um, interesting discussions about which approach um, should be used. Obviously, NATO has its approach. But I think it's really incredibly important and it's worth cataloging. And I actually see a question over here in the, in the questions that, that kind of gets to the, this. And it's like, who should be doing this? How can this cataloging happen? Um, and how will that strengthen what the allies have? I don't necessarily think every ally needs to have the exact same approach, but they do need to understand how that approach plugs into the larger NATO POC policy and concept. Um, and then just a quick note on better coordination. So among these three actors. So 
yes, of course, better coordination, I believe, is, is always better. But um, the UN, NATO, and the EU each play a very unique role in a crisis or a conflict. And so you don't want to necessarily, or at least I don't want to necessarily get them all exactly in line with one another. Um, I think what I would find most helpful is to synchronize the approaches that they already have to make commanders and planners aware of what those approaches are, and most importantly, how they can effectively coordinate across the actors. We often see um, when we go to tabletop exercises, and I've seen this from, this is not just a NATO specific comment, it's country specific as well, that people will be like, oh, you know, the UN will be handling that or so-and-so will be handling that. Um, that's a political issue, but there's no real understanding of how those things would plug in together and work together and link up. Um, so NATO doesn't need to do everything. Uh, like I said, they're a, they're a defensive uh, uh, security apparatus, but they do need to understand um, how they can plug what they are doing into what other actors in the conflict or the crisis are doing. And that includes um, into NGOs. So I think I'm going to leave it there. Um, but I do just want to point out a paper series that Stimson has been working on, um, basically pulling together different concepts like what does POC look like in an Article 5? What does it look like in an urban operation? How does resilience play along with protection of civilians? What is the political and diplomatic argument for protection of civilians. Um, and those are all accessed at a website I'm gonna drop into uh, the chat. And I just wanna say thank you uh, for having me today. And it's been a really wonderful discussion and I'm looking forward to some of these questions because I already see they're gonna be challenging. Um, I don't know if anyone has any specific questions they want to answer, but um, I see one here from our friend, Rachel. Um, and Joe, she's asking this for you. Well, she's she's saying, Joe mentioned audits um, should be conducted to assess how well POC policies are being implemented. Who should be in this audit team? What should their powers be? Would they audit states or organizations? And state auditing might see more tactical outcomes on POC. Do you want to discuss that a little bit? Yeah, thanks. Uh... Thanks, Mona. Uh, no, and that's a good that's a good moment to in fact pitch uh, uh, the paper that um, I'm working on right now um, for for Stimson um, that looks indeed on on POC preparedness and the national approaches. Uh, and that's also a little bit, I think, what the subtext was of our paper. We tried to also make the point again that at the end of the day, implementation hinges on the national level. Um, at the national level, it depends a lot again on. Uh, which POC framing and mindset the different states and the, in this case now the armed forces have, right? Um, so you have NATO allies that really prioritize NATO and NATO doctrine over, for example, the EU and the UN. Um, you also have uh, allies, uh, Western European allies that are quite um, openly hostile towards the UN's approach to peacekeeping. And they would say in military circles, they would say, look, you know, this is not really uh, what we're doing. We're doing NATO um nato approaches so this is really important to keep in mind because our perspective is not to favor one organization over the other our starting point is how do we can push poc uh in general right and if it has to be through a different channel different organization then be it and so an audit and a poc preparedness audit would also keep that in mind would look at okay what is the culture of that state which organization does it prefer if it happens to be nato okay then which elements of poc are then within, uh, for example, NATO uh, on the books already, and there are a lot. Uh, we did an analysis and you can already, I mean, you know, uh, you can of course have split hairs about the different concepts and organizational strategic approaches, but a lot of the things that NATO has been doing since 2001's doctrine on uh, peace stabilization has been linked also to POC activities similar to the UN. And then the important thing is, okay, a, a, a POC audit would look at the military capacities, the political capacities, how the state uses the different organizations in the past, lessons learned from the past, practices, and so on and so forth. And then to really have an objective assessment, what is the current state of capacities and um, you know, what needs to be done in the future. And ideally, this should be done in cooperation with the state. So in our case, we did an audit for Germany, and it was we were tasked by the uh, Ministry of Defense to do this. And then, of course, with an advisory board, you know, former uh, UN officials, former NATO officials, and so on, people that have been in the uh, 
in the field and then really assess with uh, with uh, conversations with policymakers, former military um, officials and so on and so forth, the current state of PUC preparedness. So that in a, you know, the different ways of approaching it, but that in an ideal world should be um, how you would approach uh, PUC audits. And again, I'm examining this now for, for Stimson also in terms of the NATO um, national nexus audit. Maybe if, if I could just uh, add on to that from, from the UN perspective, um, as opposed to the member state sort of perspective, the, the UN has a, actually now a pretty robust sort of monitoring and audit um, infrastructure related to POC. And, and sort of at the highest level, um, that's uh, conducted by the organization's sort of oversight and audit functions. For example, a couple of years ago, the, the Office for Internal Oversight Services conducted a, a comprehensive um, audit or review of um, uh, uh, the organization's protection of civilians, mandate implementation, kind of structures and processes, and, and um, resulted in, in quite high level suggestions on, on how the organization prepares itself. Um, but more recently, um, in the field, there's been some very interesting sort of developments in how missions um, monitor and, and sort of calculate um, pr their performance on um, protection issues. So. Um, they've recently rolled out what's called the Comprehensive Performance Appraisal System, CPAS, um, which monitors, um, sort of attempts to, to, to generate sort of evidence and data-driven um, uh, monitoring of performance on a variety of mission tasks, including POC. Um, and then um, the Department of Peace Operations um, strategic force generation and capa capability planning functions also are increasingly looking at that performance from a troop contributor by tr troop contributor uh, basis to sort of evaluate um, how individual troop contributing countries uh, perform against tasks, including POC. So there's a, a lot there. And I think um, uh, uh, some of it actually could be, could be uh, directly applicable to, to other organizations. If, if I may, just add one element. I got is that okay? And Mar Marla, thanks for <laughs> jumping in. <laughs> um, it's uh, civilians themselves, and I, there was a question by one of the panels asking about uh, the measures that civilians themselves take. And it's true that, in a sense, the first line of defense is civilians themselves, and they find ways to protect themselves. And so, I think any effort should make sure that we don't undermine these already existing mechanisms. Uh, some of them, you know, they're they're choices between bad options. Um, there are often no easy options for civilians. Um, and an important uh, link with that is seeking also to understand what civilians understand under protection and get their view on what is it that we're doing well and what is it that we're not doing well. So the accountability, what we call accountability to affected populations, because ultimately it is them who will decide whether a protection method or protection response has worked or, or not. And that requires a, a close understanding of what populations need, understanding of, of how they see risks, what would mitigate these risks, really having a conversation and getting their feedback. That's not always easy to do, but I think it's a critical element. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, to the panelists and to answer this question. Sorry for the uh, technological uh, hiccup on my hand. So we uh, received very interesting questions from, from the audience. Uh, one, that would, one that relates to uh, unarmed approaches to, uh, to, the, to protection of civilians from Gay Resemblance Kumar. So uh, I would like, so I will read the question. Uh, did the author also examine not only unarmed approaches as done by mission, but also unarmed protection approaches done by civil society actors uh, themselves, and we would really appreciate uh, your thoughts uh, in this question. Who would like to uh, answer this point? Maybe uh, Joachim first. Yeah, sure. Also, if Christian wants to add anything, uh, let me know. Um, but uh, for this re for this report, we didn't. But for another in-depth study, so for all the audit that we did for Germany, um, we looked into it because that is an emerging. We considered as an emerging important. Uh, aspect indeed of POC, also where it's um, developing. If we think, I mean, there was uh, Dirk mentioned uh, special political missions are also, of course, on the UN side important. There, I think a lot of lessons can be learned, unarmed approaches, 
Um, but also, for example, if we look at the OSCE mission, special monitoring mission, uh, you know, before the outbreak of the Russian and Ukrainian war, um, there is also, of course, a lot to be learned on, on unarmed approaches uh, where organizations, I think, are not that advanced compared to civil society um, organizations. And I think um, we also see yeah, nonviolent peace force, also the training that they're conducting more and more um, seems to be a very helpful element. Yeah, but for the IPI report, we, we did not consider it. Uh, I don't know, Christian, if you want to add anything. Okay. Anyone else would like to add also maybe from the EU and, and NATO on unarmed uh, protection approaches to, to POC? I mean, I'm happy to just note that from the civil society side, we're always advising them that it's not just you that's a protection act actor, that actually civilians themselves play an active role. So there's not, it's not like a direct thing because I think it depends on which conflict and crisis you're in, but we're definitely reminding them each time that that, that is a key thing that they need to be considering as well. So they're not actually harming the self-protection expert uh, efforts of communities themselves. Thank you very much, Marla. Uh, before I move to the uh, next question, I just want to uh, acknowledge and, and thank Ambassador Gonzato for participating in the event today. I know, Ambassador, that you'll have to leave in a couple of minutes. So uh, really to, to, thank you, uh, to thank you again for, for your participation today. Okay. Okay, we have a very uh, interesting also question from uh, Robert van Jig from the Netherlands um, about the fact that we regularly hear about the call to from the Secretary General of the UN to, to, to countries to adopt uh, national POC policies. So we'd be uh, very interested to hear from the speakers if they could elaborate a bit on the added values of national policies if countries are already part of the three institutions uh, mentioned during the, um, during the event. Thank you. Marla, would you like to start? Yeah, um, so I think this is incredibly important and all throughout the last decade of my career, we've been calling on countries to do this. Um, the good news is, is now we have so many options. You don't have to start from scratch. You can really use sort of templates that are out there. And I want to use the example of Ukraine, which I think has been incredibly um, important. So about five years ago, when I was still at Civic, we started working with Ukraine on using the NATO policy and the NATO supporting documents as a framework for them to adopt their own national POC policies and practices. And I have to tell you that I really do think the reason why we see their government and their leaders and their military so effectively capable of talking about why protection is important and providing that protection is because they did the hard work um, before the big, you know, they've been in conflict, conflict for years now with Russia, but before this most recent um, iteration. And I think that is a testimony a to the importance of countries adopting those policies and b to understanding that you need to do this proactively it's very hard to do something like this once a conflict has already started um and i think you know just the way in which their leaders talk about protection the way in which their military leaders talk about protection is just i think really interesting and it has guided a lot of the way um, that they have approached the conflict Thank you very much. Dirk, curious if you want to uh, jump in on that question. Yeah, well, maybe just in the opposite direction. Um, you know, the UN itself, you know, w w when developing um, doctrine and, and policies on protection of civilians, but, but really any other activity as well um, that is undertaken by um, troop and police contributing countries, you know, relies heavily on the doctrine and practices of member states. and. And increasingly now when sort of new areas of capabilities are being developed, um, that's done through a um, you know, multi-national um, sort, of, um, sort of coalition voluntary um, workshops with uh, various troop contributing countries who uh, offer their doctrine, be it NATO doctrine or national doctrine from other, other parts of the world that help us sort of uh, integrate a UN um, uh, uh, approach to whatever the activity um, 
could be. And of course, there are lots of different activities that contribute to, to, to POC. Um, so it's, it's indeed incredibly important that um, troops uh, and police that are eventually going to come into peacekeeping um, train against those standards you know, before they arrive, because uh, uh, as, as uh, Marla mentioned, it's, uh, it's not an easy thing to train while also working. Um, so indeed, that's, uh, that's just, uh, just as critical for us, but kind of from the opposite uh, direction. Thank you very much. Uh, we've received other interesting questions uh, from, from the audience, notably one from Stefan Bakumenko from the IPI. So as we talk of revised agilizing POC, what role can data and emerging technologies play in enhancing the effectiveness, evaluation, and public image of POC for these three organizations? I also put in here another question in case you uh, want to choose. The question is like, how do organizational differences on the use or non-use of force also define practice and policies related to POC? Who would like to jump in on one of those two? Just briefly uh, on, on the questions. data and, and new technologies. I think um, they've obviously become an important topic also in the last couple of years, um, more and more publications. We also see the practice of technologies. If you think about um, unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, also that not only the UN use, but also the OSCE yeah, in, in, in getting a lot of um, data also on how to protect infrastructure and civilians um, and massive availability of data. But the problem is it's shifted then to the next level, which is what you do with this. Um, so the problem is uh, you have uh, no shortage of data. You've got an, 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 an overflow. The problem is simply you don't have enough capacities to analyze it, uh, to then use it. Um, and you could even say in a critical way, would that help solve some of the most fundamental persistent questions of, of, of POC? It's often very much not uh, the information that we have that certain aspects are uh, or certain risk situations are occurring, but it's the, the strategic and operational decision to really do something about it, to send in a battalion uh, here rather than there and so on and so forth. So I think it is important, of course, but it will not um, help address the, the more fundamental issues, operational implementation issues, I think, for the moment. Thank you, Joe. Uh, any of the panel, any of the other panelists who would like to jump in on the on the two questions? Um, I can talk a little bit about the organizational differences on on use or non use of force. Um, so absolutely right. Each one of the organizations has a different personality, a different approach um, to how it is that they think about protection. But I actually think that's what makes them interesting and that what that's what makes them sort of able to operate in the same space if they if and when they need to, right? So for example, NATO um, is, uh, a, you know, again, defensive, uh, defensive posture but also very capable of doing um, large scale combat operations, right? Like that is their thing. That's not necessarily a UN thing, right? So I think when I think about protection of civilians, I think about what is it, so even though the concept sort of remains the same and the idea of what, the, the ultimate outcome is the same, the way in which each one of these institutions is going to go about it is very different depending on how you know, what capabilities they have, what weapons they have, if they have weapons, if they are mandated to use force, if they aren't mandated to use force. So it's really about figuring out how to apply um, the POC sort of approach within the context of what their organization is and their, their objectives are, but then also within the context of the specific crisis or conflict. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, briefly, a very last question, uh, specifically to uh, to Eva, and then I'll turn to all the panelists for a last concluding thought before we close the event. Um, so Eva, we got a few questions in relation to private military companies and their uh, involvement in armed conflict. Is it something you would like to, to address in relation to IHL support relationship? You have the floor. Sure. Th thanks. And and yes, I did post my response, but maybe that didn't just c come come through. It, it's true that there is um, a bit confusion about what the term mercenary is and might not necessarily be helpful. And depending on how close a particular private security company is to a state, it will 
will have to be regulated by the state, either that is um, where it, the company is registered, from where it is sent or where it is hosted. And so when about 20 years ago, there was an increase in the use of these companies, there were efforts notably by the government of Switzerland and, and together with, with the ICRC to see how this can be better regulated. And so I, I posted in, in the response, the link to the Montreux document forum, which it tries to do precisely that. Um, um, because it's not entirely, it, it's not as clear cut, you know, as the law always, unfortunately, the law doesn't always give us a straight answer. And so we need to really look at the, the, the facts on the, on the ground. But it's an important question and something that has now cropped up again um, over recent times in, in the different contexts. And so I also posted an article in case um, of interest that looks a little bit at the term mercenary. Thank you very much for this important point. Eva, so let me turn now uh, to the to the different uh, panelists for a concluding uh, thought. Uh, we might go in the in the reverse uh, order uh, this time. Uh, so uh, Marla, if you want to say a, a last word, then we'll go to Dirk, Eva, and, and Joaquin before we close. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just going to pick up on something that Eva said, um, and I truly do believe this. So there has been a lot of progress that has been made. Um, conceptually on the policies on all of these things, but it is all about implementation. And in my opinion, even whether you're talking about UN, AU, EU, NATO, there's still work to be done. And I think that's, it, it's important that we focus our attention there. Thank you very much, Mala. Uh, Dirk? Thanks, and, and thanks uh, again so much for having me. Um, maybe I just conclude by kind of responding to, to the second to last comment um, in the Q&A about you know, the convergence of meanings of protection um, and, and differences across doctrine. And, and I think we really shouldn't walk away from, from this discussion with the perception that um, all three of these organizations approach protection you know, uh, in the same way at, at all, um, and, and that the, the or that they should, and that they should sort of converge, particularly operationally on the ground. I think by all means, I mean, all, all three organizations generate a lot of, of uh, lessons and knowledge and um, can help inform each other. But um, for the, you know, the reasons I mentioned, I, I, I certainly wouldn't want um, there to be a suggestion that this is now a collective activity that we all do together because um, as, as Marla just mentioned, you know, these organizations exist for very, very different purposes and um, represent very uh, different constituencies. And uh, that certainly won't change and it shouldn't change. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dirk. Eva? So, you know, looking into the future, I, I think these relationships or support relationships will only increase. And, and so I think it would be important for each state when they do enter in such a partnership to think before uh, that partnership becomes live in some ways, uh, clarify and, and in a very transparent way, have a conversation with the supporting state or, or group around the importance of protection of civilians. Uh, so I think the importance of uh, thinking through that at the beginning in cl with clarity and transparency, uh, because later on, it, you know, it's much harder to address issues of harm to civilians. Yeah, no, thanks, first of all, for all co-panelists for this great insights and discussion. I, I just want to pick up, uh, maybe as a last point, that um, not too much energy should indeed be wasted on trying to now somehow make all these three organizations fit into one overarching inter-organizational uh, um, you know, structure. Uh, but what is important, again, is because the key to implementation lies with member states. Uh, or allies, member states and allies, you know, have to not only be able to support the organizations, uh, the three organizations uh, also hopefully completely engage with their training. Uh, training is also a big question still to really catch up on, um, but also really be the connector uh, for the POC agenda overall. Um, so, you know, some states are uh, strong in, in, in NATO, play a leading role in NATO, some in the EU, some in the UN, and some in all three organizations. And there can only be a benefit to the POC agenda, agenda overall if essentially the compatible elements for implementing POC overall can be pushed by a coalition of member states. Uh, but for that, you need to know the differences and similarities of three organizations and, and, and pick a, a winning formula, so to say. Thank you very much, Joe, and thank you very much to all the speakers. So we conclude here on the strong call for
for implementation. And, and that really concludes our policy forum today. I want to thank very much again, all our panelists for this really excellent and engaging discussion. And again, to the Netherlands for, for their support and to all of you for, for your participation. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day. Goodbye.